Shalom, I'm Hannah Nesher and I'm coming to you from the land of Israel. I'm from the ministry called Voice for Israel. It's voiceforisrael.net and I want to bring you a word from out of Zion to the nations. I have a message that's really on my heart that I want to share with you today that I think is really super important and I think that the the Bible that we have, the Torah, it's so relevant to our lives today. It's this ancient book, but it, it's supernatural in that it speaks to us. It speaks to our heart. It speaks to our situation that we're in today. So I pray also for you that this will speak a word in due season to your heart. And I am starting today in the book of Numbers. Bamidbar. It's about the children of Israel have just come out of Egypt and they're wandering through the wilderness and there are so many really good lessons in here to teach us. And this message is about the waters of Meribah. The waters of Meribah. So like what is that? So I'm going to read, I want to read to you a few scriptures and then we're going to unpack it and talk about it. All right, so I'm in Numbers chapter 20. And Miriam has just died, okay? They come to this place, and Miriam, that's Moses' sister, she's just passed away. And now the Israelites find that there's no water. And they start to argue, and they start to complain. They come against Moses and Aaron. So I'm starting at verse 2. It says, now there was no water for the congregation. I don't know if any of you have been to the land of Israel and been in the desert here, but... We lived in the Negev, and it can be this, it's really a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And so um, it can be scary, you know, we need water for life. So they're scared. They come here and there's no water. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses, and they spoke, saying, if only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord, why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness or into this desert that we and our animals should die here? Why did you make us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So <laughs> there's so much in here, but I'm going to try and go through it step by step by step, okay? Because it's kind of like, you know, I got downloaded all at once and I want to just kind of reveal it uh, word by word. So, first of all, Miriam has died. They come to this place, there's no water. They start to argue and complain. So, the word used here for argue is, it's a Hebrew word, reev, vayerav. Ha'am em Moshe, so the nation quarreled. Uh, the word means strive or strife or quarrel or argue. Rav, to quarrel, to strive. It also means to rebel. And so they're quarreling, they're arguing with Moses. And they say to him, why did you bring us out of Egypt to this evil place? So now, you know, they, they pleaded with God for years and years and years, hundreds of years, to deliver them from Egypt. Okay, please get us out of here. Please get us out of here. Now, they're on their way to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey and vines and figs and grapes and pomegranates and and. and and, and brooks of water and all these good things. They're on their way, but they're, they got to go through the desert. They got to go through the wilderness. And you're on the same kind of a journey, right? We've been delivered from Egypt, and then we got to go through this wilderness, this dry and thirsty place to get to our promised land. And so we can look at the Israelites and see their reaction, and we can get some insight and some wisdom for our own lives. So now they're calling Egypt good, and they're calling this place evil. Why did you ever get us out? You know, the thing is, there's a price to freedom. There is a price to freedom. When we get delivered from something, we've got to go through this transition. We've got to go through this place to get to where we're going. But the people lost their focus. You know, they were going somewhere good, but all they could see was what was around them. And they said, you know what? You guys haven't delivered on the goods. You promised. You said you would bring us to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they said, we don't, we don't see it. There's no grain here. There's no figs here. 
There's no grapevines, there's no pomegranates, there's not even any water. And I think that some people, sometimes we're like this, because God's maybe given us a promise. Maybe he says he's going to heal us, or he's going to restore our life, or he's going to bless us, and he's going to prosper us. And maybe we're headed there, we're headed towards the promise, we got to go through something first. And as we go through that, we can't get stuck by just looking at what's around us. Well, I don't see the health, I don't see the healing, I, I don't see the husband. You know, I don't see the, the good wife that you promised me. I don't, I don't see the restoration. I don't see the blessing, the prosperity. I, all I see is this desert. I, all I see is this barrenness, this emptiness, this, this lack. We can't get stuck there. We've got to keep our focus on the vision. We've got to be able to see it. And, you know, it says we don't live by, we live by faith and not by sight. That's, I think, what it means to be staying in faith and to be faithful to the vision, to the promise that God has given us and not to lose heart, not to become discouraged along the way, but to know He's going to get us there. And I think what happens is the enemy always lies to us and says, you're not going to get there. It's always going to be like this. You're always going to be sick. You're always going to be single. You're always going to be broken, poor. You're always going to be depressed. Whatever it is, you're never going to get there. This is your life. Well, this was not God's will that that was going to be their life. He wanted to bring them into the promised land, but their unbelief and their lack of faith kept them from reaching it. It wasn't God's fault. It was their fault. And so we need to examine our hearts and see where we've got unbelief or can we stay faithful to the vision? And you know what? We're going to need endurance to, to stay faithful and to keep going through this wilderness, you know, where there's snakes and scorpions. We're living here in a beautiful place in Israel. But, you know, woke up one day, went into the bathroom, there's a scorpion. It's a good thing I didn't step on it with my, with my bare feet. You know, I was walking over some palm leaves a couple years ago where I shouldn't have been walking with sandals on palm leaves, but I didn't know. And a tarantula came out, bit me on the toe, you know. And so and there's lots of snakes. We've got a WhatsApp group for our village. and People are always posting the poisonous things that, hey, this was in my house. What should I do? You know, things like that. So, I mean, life is like that. But God says he's given us power and authority to walk amongst even snakes and scorpions and nothing shall by any means harm us. So we need to be faithful as we're going through this wilderness and not start to argue and bicker and complain. This was the bad example of the Israelites to us here. They're t God is telling us these were things were written to us, an example of what not to do, okay? Don't do this. What they did, they started to quarrel, got discouraged, start to strive, come against the leaders. They were rebellious. And they called this place the waters of Meribah. I'm going to go on a little bit more. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, and he said, Take your rod and your brother Aaron and gather the congregation with you and speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield water. And then you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. And so Moses took the, ro the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And then what did Moses do? He didn't speak to the rock. He struck the rock. He didn't speak to the rock. He struck the rock. And for that act, he was barred from entering the promised land. He never made it. So I want to look at that a little bit too. Why was that so terrible, what he did? Well, first of all, why did he do that? You know, Moses had been like so patient with the children of Israel, with all of their shtoyot, all of their nonsense, all of their shenanigans, all of their complaining and rebellion and everything. He'd been so patient, but he had this moment where he just lost control. He was so tired of them and he and he said here now you rebels must we bring water for you out of this rock and he lifted his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod and water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drink so there was a, a couple problems with this first of all why did Moses act like this? I think there was something underlying it I think that Moses was still grieving over the loss of his sister 
And you know, sometimes when there's an underlying issue, something is disturbing us, we are grieving over something, we are disturbed by something, then our patience wears thin. When then we, we overreact about something, but there's, there's a deeper issue. And it's interesting that when Moses said to them, here now you rebels, okay, he called them rebels, which they were. But the word for rebels in Hebrew is using the exact same Hebrew letters as his sister's name, Miriam. So Morim and Miriam. It has different vowels, but in Hebrew, the text is written without vowels, and it's the exact same Hebrew letters. So maybe when he was overreacting, when he was reacting negatively against the people, the congregation of Israel, and struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock, maybe it was because he was thinking about his sister. Miriam, and he was grieving over his loss, and he was hurting. And sometimes when we're hurting, we're grieving, we do things that we shouldn't do. We react in ways that we shouldn't react. And so Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it. I think there's two things here. One is God wants us to understand the power of our words. He wants us to understand that we can speak forth those things which are not as though they are and can help bring them into reality. The same word for word and thing in Hebrew, diber and dabar, is, it's the same letters. So our words can actually become things, can actually become our reality. And God wanted to show them this. And instead of using faith and using his words to speak forth the water, he, he used force. He used uh, something in the flesh. He used kind of a, a fleshly weapon instead of a carnal weapon, instead of a spiritual um, tool. And so for this also, I believe that God disciplined him for that. And also because not only the loss of control and his anger and for um, not doing it the way God said to do it, but also when he struck the rock, you know, it tells us in the book of Corinthians that that rock represented the Messiah. This is 1 Corinthians. Let's just find it. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 4. And it says that they all went through the same uh, baptism through the Red Sea. Here, I'll just read it to you exactly. He says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all immersed into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. That was the manna. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was the Messiah. So that rock that Moses struck, that represented the Messiah, and that's why it was such a grievous sin. And it says, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered all over the wilderness. God was not pleased with because it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I don't care what we're doing. You know, giving all, everything you have to the poor. and I, I don't know. I don't know what you're doing to try and please God, you know, as Jewish people, sometimes we, we try and think that, you know, if we keep enough commandments, if we keep enough laws, and we've had a lot of, um, in, in modern Judaism, we've had a lot of man-made rules and regulations and laws added to the commandments of God. And we think if we keep enough of those, you know, and we, we wear black and we, you know, grow out our, our payot and, and, and long beard and long tzitzit and fringe and everything, you know, that's going to please God. Well, what pleases God is faith. When we believe Him, when we refuse to limit the Holy One of Israel, when we say, I know that God can do anything, nothing is too hard for my God. My God is unlimited. He is mighty. He's bigger than the giants. You know, that, it's faith that honors God. And I know we're all fighting the fight of faith. I, I have my own <laughs> battle to fight the fight of faith when we're, when we're facing stuff. But it says, in verse 6, now these things became our examples to intent we should not do the things that they did. 
So it's written, it's kind of like an open book exam. It's written so we will not do the things that they did in the desert. They lusted, they, they were greedy, they, were, they indulged in sexual immorality. One of the things they did, it says they complained. Do not complain as they complained because they were destroyed. You know, complaining and arguing will destroy us. It says do all things without arguing and without complaining so that we will be shining lights in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. Are we living in the midst of a dark and perverse generation? Yes. How do we shine as lights? We don't argue and we don't complain. We live in love and joy and peace and we have all these beautiful qualities of the Holy Spirit and that's how we shine as a light. So I just want to go back to this text about the waters of Meribah because it says that in verse 13 it says this was the water of Meribah because the children of Israel contended I, I wish I could just show you this I want to show you this in the Hebrew so you see that the word for contending or arguing or striving is this word Meribah it's related to the to what they call the waters the waters of Meribah and also when Moses struck the rock it's like do we need to give you water out of this rock? You know, as if Moses was, was doing the miracle. He didn't give the glory to God. He kind of, in this moment of weakness and just complete exasperation, he took the glory for himself. Okay, I'm, I'm going to hit this rock and give you water. You know, instead of always, he had been so humble and always giving the glory to the Lord. So this was the water of Meribah because the children of Israel contended with the Lord. You notice something interesting because at the beginning it says, and the people contended with Moses, saying, why did you ever bring us here? Now a little farther down it says, the people of Israel contended with the Lord. And this is showing us when we contend with people, especially people in leadership, when we argue with them, we contend and we strive with them, it's like we are contending with the Lord. You know, earlier on when the children of Israel were complaining, he said God heard all of their complaints. And, and he said, your complaints are not against us, they're against the Lord. So when we complain about our situations, we complain about life, we're really complaining about God because God's on the throne, he's in charge of our life. So we're complaining against what God is doing or is not doing or is giving us or not given us in our life and God wants us to live with gratitude and with peace and with love and with joy but there's a problem here okay so this word Meribah it's actually like two words in one it's yes Larif to argue, but it also used the word mar. Meriba is mar and reeve together. Mar means bitter. So, and I believe there's a reason why this word is together because bitterness and arguing or contention, it goes together. Bitterness and strife goes together. People who are bitter, they argue, they strive, they are hard to get along with, right? They're obnoxious, <laughs> like Naomi in the book of Ruth. You know, she said, the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. You know, her husband died, her two sons died, they were living in Moab, they had left the land and all this disaster came upon them. She comes back into the land and she said, the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara. So Naomi comes from the word Naim, which means pleasant. She said, don't call me pleasant, I'm not, I'm not pleasant anymore. Call me Mara, I am bitter. I am bitter, she said, call me Mara. You know, in Hebrew, when you want to know what somebody's name is, you don't say, what's your name? You say, how are you called? Ech korim lecha, or ech korim lach. I would say, korim lichana. I am called Hannah. So how are you called? How are you called? What do people say about you? How are you called? Are you called kind? Are you called good-natured? Or are you called bitter? Are you called argumentative? How are you called? It says that the servant of the Lord must not be 
quarrelsome. If we want to be servants of the Lord, we've got to be people who are easy to get along with, who try to strive for peace, not for war. So I'm thinking about the Israelites. Why were they like this? You know, we look at them, we're like, ugh. Why are you like this? You know, it's not even you look at people and you're like, why are you like this? I think the root of it is bitterness. And the Bible says, beware of a bitter root that can spring up and cause trouble and defile many. So we got to be careful that we don't allow this bitterness to take root in our heart. So why were the Israelites so bitter? Well, obviously, they had just been hundreds of years being mistreated and abused as slaves in Egypt. So they come out of there, they're bitter. They're bitter. And when Moses, in the book of Exodus, Moses and Aaron came and they tried to talk to them. They tried to say, we're, we, we've come to deliver you. Things are going to get better. We're going to get you out of here. You know, they were just, it says they couldn't even listen to them. Because of it says their anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Some people have had such anguish of spirit. They've been in such cruel bondage to the enemy for so long that they become bitter. They've been abused. Maybe they've been in abusive relationships or whatever it is. Uh, bondage of addictions, whatever it is, can cause people to become bitter. And I believe that God wants to set people free from bitterness to become sweet. So I guess that's my question to you. Are you drinking at the waters of Meribah? Are you drinking of the waters of bitterness? I heard somebody say once something that is funny in a bad way. He said, some people are not just sipping at the waters of bitterness, but they filled up a whole canteen and they carry it on their backs wherever they go. And that's so true. It's so true. Some people just carry this bitterness with them. Everywhere they go, they just get thirsty. They take a drink from their canteen of the waters of Meribah. And God wants to show us a better way. In Psalm 106, it talks about the, the waters of Meribah. And it says, 30, verse 32, they angered him at the waters. In English, my English translation says, the waters of strife. Okay, but it's in Hebrew, it's the waters of Meribah. They angered God at the waters of Meribah. It angers God when we cause strife in, in, in relationships, in families, in, in congregations, in nations. It angers God. He doesn't like when we are people who cause strife. And then it says, so it went, it went ill with Moses. In Hebrew, literally, it went bad for him. It went bad for Moses. You know why? Because it says because of them. It went bad for Moses on account of them because they rebelled against his spirit. That's the word again. Reeve, rebellion. They rebelled against the spirit of God so that Moses spoke rashly with his lips. So, you know, if there is somebody, if there's people around us that are causing strife, it can even make it go badly for us. You know, we we got to deal with it and we got to be careful that we don't enter into that same spirit of strife. The spirit of strife will destroy everything. I want to show you this in Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17 verse 1, it says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. You know, and there's been times when, you know, cook a big feast, cook a big dinner, big turkey, Thanksgiving dinner, or a big roast beef, and all the fixings. But, you know, if there isn't peace at the dinner table, what does it matter? You'd be better off, I think, just having a, having a salad <laughs> and having peace than having a big feast but strife. Because how can you even digest your food? if there's arguments at the table. And also says in verse 14, the beginning of strife is like releasing water, therefore stop contention. And that word again for contention is reeve, resh, yud, vet. Stop the arguing, stop the contention before a quarrel breaks out. Strife will destroy everything, it will destroy our health, it will destroy the blessings and the prosperity that God wants to bring on us, on our family, on ourselves individually, on our marriage, on our relationships, on our business, on our congregation. 
and on our nation. We live in the midst of a nation that is so full of strife, it's unbelievable. Between the secular and the orthodox and even between the religious is all these different um, different kind of Jewish groups and just last week we had the whole Ethiopian um, Community rise up in protest all over the country. They stopped traffic on the major highways People were stuck in traffic for for hours and hours and hours. There was cars set on fire and turned over Policemen many policemen were hurt and injured a lot of the because it was over something that happened I don't want to get into the whole story it can you can email me and I can I can send you an article about it but anyways the point is maybe where you live too maybe you live in a place that's just full of strife and rebellion and protesting we got to be careful that we keep ourselves set apart from that so we got to walk in the opposite spirit We've got to walk in love. We got to strive for peace. You know that scripture that I told you about the to be careful of this bitter root that it doesn't take take root. It, it's a poison. It says it's a it's po a po like a poisonous plant. It's toxic, and it says the scripture right before that. It says pursue peace with all people. We have got to try and live in peace. Otherwise, it's like we're handling this poisonous plant, this toxic plant. When we first came to Israel, we found these cool plants that we thought were really um, great because you could kind of write with them. They kind of had this this dye on them, and 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 you could write. And the kids found out that you could you could use it for a dye. Well, what we didn't know is these plants were poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> they were toxic and they, they, they start to itch all over and get a rash all over. Soon learned not to touch those plants. Well, bitterness is like that. You know, there may be something appealing about, you know, talking about our grievances and arguing and stuff like that in the flesh, but we, we have to stay away from that and not touch it because it's poisonous, it's toxic, it is bad for us. And it will make things bad for everybody else too. So what are the, some of the symptoms of people who are bitter? Well, usually they're cynical, they hold grudges, they want a lot of attention, they are negative, they are jealous. And what's the cure? What is, okay, okay, we've established bitterness, bad, arguing, bad. What's the cure for it? There's only one cure and that's forgiveness. The only cure is forgiveness we need to let go and let God you know there's the story of Joseph in the Bible how he was betrayed by his brothers thrown into the pit uh, sold to Ishmaelite traders spent years in Egypt as a slave as a servant and then he he did the right thing and he ran away from Potiphar's wife and didn't sin with her and he got thrown in prison forgotten there for years and years if anybody had a right to be bitter I think it was Joseph and yet when his brothers came back to Egypt looking for food and they didn't recognize him, what he expressed to them was such a supernatural forgiveness. He said, don't be angry with yourselves. Don't be grieved with yourselves. For God brought me here to save many people. What you meant for evil, God turned for good. And we've got to believe that, that even the things that people mean for evil against us, God will somehow turn it for good. And I believe if Joseph hadn't forgiven his brothers, he couldn't have continued to rule in that position of authority that he had. If we're going to be in positions of authority and leadership, we've got to be people who are good forgivers. Yeshua when he was crucified and dying on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. He's talking about the people who crucified him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And, you know, there's an interesting thing that happened um, that talks again about the bitter waters, the waters of bitterness. And it's in um, Exodus 15. And the children of Israel just come out of Egypt. And they were complaining against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. This is Exodus 16. And again, they say, oh, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Why did you bring us out here to kill us? Blah, blah, blah. Argue, argue. Complain, complain. Right? And it says that they came 
to the waters of Mara. Remember, Mara means bitterness. They came to these waters that were bitter waters. They couldn't drink them because you see, here's the thing is that we are supposed to have living waters flowing out of our belly that people can drink of that. You know, when Yeshua went to the woman who had had five husbands or maybe, and she was living with somebody that wasn't her husband and he, he revealed himself as Messiah to her and he said, I can give you water that you'll never thirst again. He was referring to the waters of the spirit, the living waters. These are the waters that people need for life. We can't be bitter believers <laughs> and offer people waters of life. It just doesn't work that way. What's going to come out of us will be bitter waters. And nobody can, will be able to get life out of it. So they came to these waters, um, Exodus 15, verse 23, when they came to Mara, when they came to the place of bitterness, they could not drink the waters of Mara because they were bitter. So the name of it was Mara, which is bitter. And the people complained, what should we drink? And so they cried out to the Lord and how they, he showed Moses how to change the bitter waters into sweet. What he did was he picked up a tree and he threw it into the waters. And when he threw the tree into the waters, the waters were changed from bitter to sweet. I feel like this is symbolic. This is showing us this tree represents the tree on which Yeshua was executed. It's the execution tree, the execution stake, the cross. And when the cross was thrown into those bitter waters, those words, those words vibrated through the waters. And it was, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when the vibration of those words of forgiveness went through the waters, those bitter waters were turned into sweet, and the people could drink it, and they could live, and they could find life. And so the only way that we're going to be healed of this bitterness is when we look up to the cross, and we hear those words where Yeshua said to the people who crucified him, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And if we can say those words from our heart to the people who have hurt us, the people who have abused us or mistreated us or whatever life has thrown at us, and if we can forgive and say, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. If we can bless our enemies and pray for them, we will be healed. You know, it says in John 3, 14, that just as Moses had to lift up that bronze serpent in the desert and that everybody that looked up to it was healed. So Yeshua must be lifted up on the cross. When we look up to him and we hear those words of forgiveness against those who crucified him, then we can be healed of this bitterness. I know a lot of people have been through a lot of hard things. I know you've been through things that may have caused you to become bitter and maybe rightly so. But I believe that this is God's time for you to let it go and to be healed of this bitterness because you know that it was at the waters of Mara where God revealed himself as our healer. It was there at the waters of Mara when the bitter waters were turned into sweet that he said, if you heed the voice of the Lord your God and you do what's right in his sight, you keep his commandments, I'll put on none of these diseases that I brought on the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rophe. I am the Lord who heals you. I am God, your physician, your healer. The one who wants, God wants to heal us, but maybe the first healing that he needs to do in us is a healing of the bitterness. I believe it. I believe that we need to be healed of bitterness in order that we can walk in that health and that blessing and that prosperity that God wants to give us. Just remember, we are on our way somewhere good. God is taking us into a good land. So don't lose heart in the wilderness. Don't be like the children of Israel. It says that they got discouraged. The soul of the people became discouraged along the way. Numbers 21. Verse 4, and they said again, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? You know what? God didn't save us. He didn't save us from the kingdom of darkness just to let us die in the wilderness. He brought us out to bring us to the promised land. And we're going to get there if we'll just stay in faith. If we don't start to get discouraged, disheartened, and lose heart in the wilderness along the way. Because they complained. They said there's no food and no water here. And we hate this disgusting Manna. That's kind of literally what they said in Hebrew. I hate this. We loathe this disgusting 
manna. Well, that was God's provision for them. That was keeping them alive. So they're being ungrateful. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and bit the people and they died. And that's why Moses had to lift up that bronze serpent on the pole that they would look up to, to Yeshua on the cross, in a sense, and to be healed. So I hope this message has been a blessing to you. I think if you didn't need it, I needed it. <laughs> because we're all on our way to the promised land. And I don't know about you, but... I don't want to just die in the wilderness and have my carcass spread out all over the wilderness and for it to be said about me. And with her, the Lord was not well pleased. Because of her unbelief, she could not enter in the promised land. I want to be somebody who goes all the way, enters into the promised land in faith and makes it through the wilderness. And so let us really pursue peace with all people. Don't just look at everything around you and think, I'll never get out of this. You're going to get out of this. God's taking you a good place. Stay in faith. Keep praising Him. Keep being thankful for what He has already provided for you. It says that we are in need of endurance. And that is a word for today like no other. We need to be thankful people. We need to give thanks in all things. And we need to pursue peace with all people and really avoid arguing and complaining because this is you know what you can still uh, be a believer and act that way but in first Corinthians uh, chapter 3 verse 3 it says this is this is how carnal believers this is how carnal Christians act right is in envy and strife and striving and arguing and so we can believe and still act in a way we shouldn't all right so let's walk in the opposite spirit in faith, in love, in hope, in peace, in shalom. And let's believe that we are going to make it to the promised land. Let's stop drinking from the waters of Meribah. It's bitter water as the Lord wants to heal us and deliver us and make the bitter water sweet. So we are going to be people who are sweet and who can help bring life to others. So shalom and thanks for having the patience to listen to this message. We are uh, just so blessed and so thankful to be able to bring you the word of God from Zion out into the nations where you are. And we just ask you to, if you're blessed by the message, share it with others, subscribe to our YouTube channel, sign up for our Torah studies on our website, voiceforisrael.net. And better yet, come to Israel on our tours in 2020 and uh, just meet us here and journey with us through the promised land. All right, shalom.